Are we live now, President Frank Junga? <laughs> Are we live now? I think yes. All right. Okay. So um, we are having some uh, technical problems with the, uh, or oh, better, our presenter is having some technical problems. So I'm going to try to replace her for a minute. Um, as a chairman of a China Center, which belongs to a university, I would like first to thank Horace for giving us the opportunity to talk about uh, the report on uh, <clears throat> Chinese family businesses, the future, the trends, the path, the future, the trends, uh, and the path, sorry. Um, and also to Chen Kong the School of Business, because it's been a pleasure to work with them to launch this report. Having said that, I would like we teletransport ourselves into the living room of a historian in year 2020 who was trying to understand <clears throat> what happened in the beginning of the 21st century. I think our historian will highlight two events. First, the fall of the Twin Towers in September <clears throat> 2001, and second, this economic health crisis. And she would do that because both events belong to a, a new global paradigm as yet to be defined. However, I think that this historian would still notice that some things would remain unchanged. I think there would still be family business around the world. Either we are going today to try to understand what is happening with the family businesses in this crisis we are in. Give you the floor. Great, thank you very much, Felix, for the opening. I would just like to echo that representing the Chung Kong Graduate School of Business, or CKGSB, uh, it's been a pleasure to work with IE, China Center, and also with Horasis this time to discuss this important topic of family businesses in China. Um, I'd just like to say a few words about why we're working on this topic and its importance. Um, we are looking at family businesses in China, as Felix mentioned, the role, the trends, challenges, and opportunities, because it's a, an important topic as family businesses globally make up more than 70% of the GDP. And in China, out of 60% of China's GDP that is made up of private enterprises, 85% are family run. So they make an important economic contribution and therefore have to be well understood. But particularly in such an uncertain time where change has become a constant and is in a way the new normal, it's more important than ever before to understand how our agile, adaptable family business is coping. In fact, adaptability is a particular strength of Chinese family businesses, from transforming their business lines, their target audiences or customers. They are resilient, quick to change in crises, quick to make decisions, and willing to follow new trends. We'd like to learn more about how they are coping in these times and what challenges and opportunities they face. This is particularly what the joint report that Felix mentioned has conducted between IE and CKGSB finds. Today we'll look at some of the findings and we'd love to share the report with all of you. Um, with that, I would like to introduce two of our main speakers today. Today we have the uh, IE Professor of Leadership and Academic Director of the IE China Center, Ma Bin. And we have the Chung Kong Graduate School of Business, um, Professor of Economics, Fan Xinyu joining us. I would like for each professor, perhaps starting with Professor Ma, to give a quick five minute remark <laughs> on the topic, and we'll dive into a very interesting discussion about family businesses in China. So perhaps Professor Ma, you could go first, followed by Professor Fan. Thank you, Yura. It's my great pleasure to be here today sharing our thoughts of um, uh, understanding Chinese family businesses, the path, the trend, and the future. And at IE China Center and IE University, 
uh, what we are trying to do is to understand the rise of uh, Chinese economy, and we want to learn from the Chinese business models, practices, and the policies, so we can create some knowledge for a global benefit. And uh, this year, at the beginning uh, of our yearly report, uh, we were trying to answer a question of uh, whether the Chinese economy has the potential to continuously grow, and whether the family businesses will still be the main power, main engine uh, behind the Chinese economy. But as we all know, in the middle of the year, the global pandemic happened. So we were thinking uh, it would be not be a complete report if we don't capture the challenges caused by COVID-19 and to understand the future collaborations in China. So in order to answer these two questions, we first look at a five-year uh, track on um, 338 Chinese family businesses. Uh, we want to see their trend of um, uh, growth and um, trying to use this trend to predict the future growth. So you can see the distribution of the family business we looked at is pretty broad. We have uh, provinces and industries covered. And uh, according to these data, we have uh, posted the growth of the company along with the economy GDP of China, and we can see a clear growth trend. But at the same time, we also see the competition is getting more and more severe each year. So this gives us a foundation of understanding the future uh, growth of uh, a Chinese economy. But with the pandemic, we interviewed 20 family business uh, owners of their, uh, the, the challenges they are facing. So most of them are reporting a huge growth or loss on growth uh, uh, in, the, in this year, comparing to the se same season in the past year. And uh, further in the uh, interviews, we're trying to use a cultural perspective to capture some of the Chinese family businesses practice in post pandemic recovery. At the same time, we compare the cultures uh, across seven countries and try to see whether some of the strategies and practices that has been helping Chinese family business to recover, whether those strategies are useful for other countries or replicable in other countries. So first we, can, uh, we looked at individualism versus collectivism. As we all know, the Chinese culture is very collective and they highlight the value of in-group friendships. So in their post-pandemic recovery, most of the interviewees, we asked the question about their financial sources. They are all pointing out family as their first uh, finance resources to go, and the, the second goes to their business partners. So that's a very uh, a good representation of uh, collectivism, collectivism. And comparing to other countries, this may not be that easy to duplicate. Long-term orientation, that is represented by a high saving rates in China. And again, in this time of uncertainty, it will be very important. And also that indicates to collaborate with your Chinese business partners, you need to build trust in the longer term and uh, be ready to spend the time to invest the time on these collaborations. And further, masculinity, that's to represent whether a, a, a society is uh, ready or is driven by competition and um, efficiency. And when it's necessary, whether um, people in this society is ready to sacrifice family and leisure time for their work. And this is to understand the rhyme at work across different countries. And we can see different countries have different scores on this perspective. And uh, China is very high on masculinity uh, uh, together with the other four countries we listed here. So in these countries, I think we believe people are more success driven. And the last one, last second one, uncertainty avoidance is to tolerate uncertainty. 
And again, we see this as a favorable feature in a time of crisis and uncertainty. Last one is power distance, which is also always viewed as the biggest cultural difference between Eastern and Western countries. And uh, because of this high power distance, the interviewees we had, had uh, showed a very high degree in their confidence on the Chinese government's recovery policies in the post-pandemic period. So altogether, uh, once again, we answered the first question whether Chinese economy is still powerful. The answer is yes. And second, we were trying to capture the challenges and uh, the confidence uh, of the recovery, post-pandemic recovery. And the answer is we found cultural similarities uh, between some countries, but there is no identical culture, which means the solution of post-pandemic recovery will not be universal. Thank you so much. And I'm more than happy to dis discuss more about the details in our uh, further discussion. Thank you, Professor Ma, for the economic contribution and cultural perspective provided about family businesses in China. Professor Fan, would you like to present your ideas as well before passing the floor to our moderator, Margaret, who has joined for the discussion? Yes, I was trying to, um, uh, let's see, I have tried to uh, share the screen, try the screen sharing before. I'm trying to do that again here. Just allow me uh, to reopen the file. Oh, by the way, while I was uh, opening the file, I would like to really uh, uh, to show my appreciation about uh, the family business report that is co-published by the two schools because, um, uh, you know, um, from the academic uh, point of view, it's usually very, very difficult to conduct family business researches uh, because um, uh, the key constraint here. Oh, by the way, can you share this? Uh, can you see the screen right now? Yes, you we can see, see the. Okay, very nice. So the key constraint in uh, uh, the family business research is, is that it's very hard to collect a large number of family business and keep track of them for a number of years. And I think what's brilliant about this report is that we successfully managed to pull it off. So uh, once again, uh, so that's about uh, the report. Uh, I will highly recommend every one of you to take a couple look at it. And uh, can, shall I start my presentation? And I guess I will, um, I will, I will start right now. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well, very and nice. we can. Okay, the let's get started. So, um, um, first of all, uh, thank you for the introduction, and uh, uh, thank uh, Horatius for the invitation. So uh, today, I'm going to talk very briefly about understanding Chinese family businesses. A, a, a comparative perspective. And due to the uh, time constraint, I will go directly into the two comparisons I would like to draw your attention to today. So the first comparison is about uh, comparing the uh, uh, organizational structure. So first of all, if you think about family businesses, well, there's usually a boss at the top and there are several family members uh, associated with the boss's family. And the family members can serve either within the family or they can uh, serve for the family businesses. Of course, uh, these members might not suffice to run the business. Uh, some, sometimes or oftentimes, there will be professional managers come to help to run the business as well. And when the time comes, um, they, they might be the family business might be in need of next generation entrepreneurs who might come from either from within the family or maybe uh, they are to be selected by the professional managers. And uh, these are the structures of family businesses. And if you really think about it, it quite resembles the organizational structures in dynasties and kingdoms where you have, once again, an emperor at the top, basically making all the decisions. The, there is a royal family. Family members can either be within the family or they can also serve administrative roles uh, for the royal court. And they are, of course, bureaucrats and military generals uh, to help to run the regime, to guard the realm. And when the time comes, there will be uh, next generation rulers to be selected, uh, sometimes from within the royal court and sometimes elsewhere. 
So you can see here the stock similarities between the two types of organizations, which makes us want uh, because we have a long history and uh, a rich, very rich stories of dynasties and kingdoms. Can we basically draw the insights from dynasties and kingdoms and shed light on uh, uh, understanding uh, deeper into family businesses? So uh, the answer is definitely yes. And if you think about or if you speak about long history, China definitely has a very long history and rich historical writings about this important event in history. So here's a very brief illustration, uh, illustration of what we have done. We have collected from the, uh, the orthodox histories, which is um, um, more famously known as the 24 histories in Chinese. Uh, it's a great, a grand collection of historical writings uh, consisting of more than 3,000 volumes and more than 47 million words. Uh, of course, you will expect that every, um, every emperor's doing is uh, written in detail in these records. And more importantly, uh, the, the, the collection of historical records also wrote down more than 8,000 uh, noted bureaucrats about their whole career path starting from where do they come from and how do they enter the bureaucracy and also about their end games, meaning that uh, uh, do they retire peacefully uh, when they're older or do they get kicked out from the regime? So when you study these dynamics about uh, the career path of a bureaucrat, the dynamics between the interaction of the interaction between the emperor and the professional uh, bureaucrats, well, the insights that you derive from these stories can be directly applied to the dynamics and the interactions between a boss in the family business and his fellow professional managers. So that's the first comparison I would like to draw your attention to and the great potential in it in, in terms of understanding deeper about family business, especially in China. And the second comparison I would like to draw your attention to is what I call the double transformation, which is also in the family business research report that we uh, published today. So uh, the double transformation, meaning the self-reinforcing cycle between digital transformation and family business transformation. So the story is as follows, very briefly. If you think about the next generation entrepreneurs, they're usually the young and energetic entrepreneurs who are who are, who are more likely to embrace modern technologies. So they are the one who are more likely to implement digital transformation in their own family business. And of course, when they do so, are the, are the expertise, the leadership experiences, the management exp uh, experiences that they have accumulated will consolidate their legitimacy uh, in their family business transition. And when they have consolidated uh, their, in their family business a transition process. Well, they have more say in the family, which they will further enhance the process of digital transformation in their family business even further. So here you can see how this cycle gets rolling. More digital transformation leads to smoother family business transition and more uh, and better family business transition will further enhance or put forth the digital transformation of the modern corporation into the future. So let me recap very briefly. So the two comparison we, we, we are trying to draw your attention to is that looking back, we find that imperial history offers uh, quite a field of contemporary insights for us to think about. And looking ahead, we can see uh, that digital transformation of corporations offer unique opportunities for us to conduct better family business succession processes. And, uh, oh, right on time. So that will be my presentation today for you. And I'm, uh, as Professor Ma says, I'm very much looking forward to the discussion, uh, in a few minutes. So that's it. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you very much, Professor Ma. I think we've had such a great introduction into the topic from your perspective, both a historical look and a future look at the double transformation of the digital transformation of family businesses and from Professor Ma earlier, the economic contribution and cultural perspective. With that, I'd like to pass the floor to Ms. Margaret Chen, CEO of Optimus Horizon, who will moderate what promises to be a very interesting discussion between the two professors. Margaret? Hi, good morning. Thank you. Um, Paul, apology for 
the last minute uh, problem that I had with the operating system. I had to change another PC. But anyway, I'm here and uh, really appreciate the invitation from Felix and the congratulations for the, the publishing of this report. I think it is very important and it is a, it is a, the new topic at, at this period of time, which is a transition of everything, let's say, including the, the globalization. No? But still, I think China believes uh, globalization. China is the benefiter of this globalization. And uh, I think that even like Professor Fan said, we have long history of the family business, in fact, but it was in what interrupted, you know, for some years. And now they are the new generation of the new the family business. And uh, whether Chinese people will be able to continue, you know, its uh, heritage or this is going to be changed. But anyway, I think the digital world makes the whole difference, you know. So and the, for the good and for the bad, I think. Uh, but I think there is also one thing that we know that um, China uh, is a difference of the Western world that the family business, sometimes uh, they're inherited with people who, who is not from the direct blood family. And, and Chinese people has a special quality of getting better relation even with somebody who is not from the family. And maybe this is also the answer of the future because sometimes the generations and generations, they don't understand. And uh, the next generation doesn't want to uh, inherit and continue, you know, the, the family business for some reasons, you know, especially, you know, when I see the Chinese people overseas, you know, mm -hmm. when their parents created the big business, you know, in other countries like in Spain, our uh, situation, and the second generation doesn't want to continue. They want to do something different. They even want to accept just one wage, you know. So I think that... Uh, we are here uh, facing a very, very interesting question, and uh, I'm going to uh, just do my moderator work, <laughs> moderator work. So I would like to launch with the first question with Professor Ma. What are the remaining challenges for Chinese family business in the future of globalization or delocalization? I see. Thank you, Margaret. Um, so with this question, I think first is uh, we are facing a trend of anti-globalization everywhere, right? Every government is trying to encourage their people to buy more local and to support local market, local manufacturer, local business. So I think with this pandemic and the, the challenges caused for economy, this trend will be more severe. So I think for Chinese family businesses, they are going to face a shrinking global market and a more, I would say, conservative global business environment in the near future. Uh, and so that poses barriers to enter a uh, foreign market. That's one thing. And second is um, the innovation-related issue, right? We, we all know uh, we have may have some stereotypes about the Chinese company's innovation ability. And on this sense, actually, a lot of um, Chinese businesses are, are doing a very good job uh, to uh, make more innovation investment and uh, strengthening their brand together with innovation and technology. Uh, so that's another challenge I think they are going to continuously facing. And of course, going back to our report, which highlighted the cultural difference, and that would be something you need to consider as Chinese business to operate in a foreign country, right? Whether your behaviors will be understand or misunderstand. And the last one is, um, I want to echo what you just said, Marguerite, about the succession. Uh, I would say the cross-generation succession is a challenge. In one of my other research, we had 120 uh, first-generation uh, family business owners, and their average age is about 50. 
So we all know that in China, the more or less retirement age is 60. So that means in a few years, they are going to face succession uh, uh, challenges. And I agree with you. Um, this challenge may not necessarily be solved within the family. So to success, to, to pass your uh, business down to the next generation is a choice, but may not be a must. Okay. So these are the things I think the Chinese family business are going to face in the very near future. So deglobalization, enter to the for foreign market, strengthen their innovation, uh, pay attention to the cultural differences when they operate in the foreign market, and then their succession plans. Thank you very much. And uh, I fully agree. You know, I think that uh, the family business also has the challenge of the corporate culture, you know, and also the, the language barrier. And, uh, you know, so for the last 200 years, China went down so much that the Western world uh, doesn't even want to know what happened in China. Now China is up. So whether the Western world should study more about the Chinese culture or the Chinese also need to extend, you know, the, the hand and to get to know the Western corporate culture. Okay, my second question goes to Professor Fan. What is the role of the family business in the post-pandemic economic recovery of China? Will this be the same case in the Western country? Well, um, uh, I, I think the, the, one of the points that uh, Professor Ma highlighted in the report is that there are cultural differences and there are also cultural similarities. So if you, um, first of all, it's a great question if you think about um, uh, the, the, the post pandemic economic recoveries and the private sector and in particular the family business are playing great roles and very important roles, vital roles uh, throughout this process. And uh, if you want to separate them into, let's say, several categories, I think I will, set, I will, I will list down at least two or three separate categories of uh, the roles that families business can serve in, in post pandemic recoveries. I think the first one is very straightforward is the adaptive uh, production processes because you know all these family businesses, all these private enterprises in China are, are highly agile in the sense that they can switch their business model quite quickly. They switch producing different products quite uh, swiftly. And you can see that when, when face masks is in great demand, uh, they are various of their numerous firms. Uh, conducting uh, the production process of facial masks, and many of them are actually our alums. Um, I would really like to show you, uh, it's not here, but just over there, uh, uh, the facial masks that we use here, uh, uh, we, are, we are very proudly using the facial masks producing by our own alums, and there are dozens of them doing this business. So first of all, the adaptive production process. The second role, I think, is the role of social responsibility. That's another thing that I am really proud of, uh, of the, the not only the, the overall family business entrepreneurs, uh, but also because many of them are also our CKGSC alums. So what they have been doing is that, uh, um, uh, of course, uh, they are business motives in the area of pandemic, but also they are social motives to produce what's in need to transport the needed medical equipment, medical devices to the regions in need. And in these processes, once, once again, because of the flexibility of private entrepreneurs, we can always see those uh, uh, senior ones and the junior ones and the front line in this combat, uh, in, in, in this, uh, in this, in this battle against uh, COVID-19. So the second category I want to emphasize is the role of social responsibility. And the last category, uh, I want to emphasize is uh, is, is that I think a, a great thing for, for private enterprises, because as Ira mentioned, private enterprises uh, or the private sectors consists of a very large amount of the total economy, especially when you think of, uh, think about employment. That'll be 80%, even 90% of the total employment are in private sectors, non-state owned enterprises sectors. And, you know, throughout this, uh, pandemic areas, we can see, we can see many stories of these private entrepreneurs creating a supporting culture 
to the local economy. So uh, one of the examples I really like is the example of uh, Wakanda Coffee. That's a small, very cafe in the city of Wuhan, the center of this uh, pandemic uh, in, in earlier this year. So you can see, uh, first of all, this little cafe trying to provide free coffee to the medical staff uh, beginning this year when the pandemic is at its worst in mainland China. So you can see the supporting culture from the cafe to the hospitals. And later on, when the news come out that these guys are, are, are supporting uh, free cafe, uh, free coffees to the medical staff, you can see uh, people all around China are submitting online orders to this uh, little, little cafe and trying to show their support to their deeds of kindness. You can see this uh, supporting culture bring uh, throughout this uh, area. So I think I will put the third category of the roles to be uh, to try to create a supportive culture. A great question. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, good. Uh, I think you touched very important aspect. You know, I think the corporate responsibility. This mm -hmm. is something I think something new for China. I think yeah. even yeah. in the history, we don't have that, and now we're in a new uh, new era. And uh, so that so I I still want to ask you. Beyond the economic contribution mm -hmm. of the the family business, uh, what they will contribute to the China strategy in the world full of uncertainty? You know that uh, we are yeah. facing. Uh -huh. I think your previous comment is perhaps the best answer to this question already. That is uh, uh, corporate social responsibility because. Uh, I was I was watching TV the other day following the the U.S. presidential election on CNN. I think Van Jones mentioned a word, well, not a word, a phrase. It's that character matters. I think uh, what uh, the, the the question it asks is about what can the family business in China contribute beyond economic uh, economic contributions. I think a key element in that is that try to create uh, the 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 character or the image of an enterprise is of enterprises full of social responsibilities. And this also goes back to your previous, your opening comment in that sometimes, well, if you think about family and business successions, uh, the younger generation doesn't necessarily need to take up or doesn't necessarily want to take up the job of their uh, parents. And so I guess then it brings down to a perhaps more general or sometimes more deeper question about what is the legacy that you want to pass on to your next generation? Is it a business or is it an entrepreneurial spirit or is it a common, a shared value of what to do and what not to do? So I think uh, the, that is something way beyond economic contributions. And, but that is perhaps something precisely that we want to focus on or, or we need to focus on in terms of family businesses. And uh, um, do you have time for another <laughs> short story? Uh, because uh, I, uh, that rem because uh, we do have a, a, a CKGSB alum who has uh, who is the second generation. Uh, his father is the first generation. He's a second generation, and he has a very cute son. Um, and basically, he in uh, in his chat, basically he mentioned that uh, every day the way he teaches his son to how to uh, make friends in schools, how to be a good leader, as well as a good uh, teammate with his, uh, with his classmates, are precisely the way that his father taught him 30 years earlier. So you can see that it's nothing about how to do business. Uh, the family business is about automobile accessories. It's nothing about that, but it's about how to be a good person, to do the right thing. That's the legacy that we can see through this uh, family uh, succession. Uh, so it's go way beyond businesses, uh, go way beyond economic contributions. Yeah. That will be my Yeah, t totally agree. I think that, uh, you know, the Chinese business, uh, Chinese succession, uh, traditionally, yeah. it, it, you know, we all have the very strict uh, education from our parents. We mm -hmm. also, we know. Now with the one child per family, I don't know, this has happened, uh, this has changed, you know, because it's so much uh, uh, care, you know, from the family, yeah. 
for one child, you know, and they, they are spoiled. They don't have supposed to suffer, you know. So this, will this change something, you know? And uh, okay, I want to ask one question to Professor Mar. How do you ensure effective governance in a family business and minimize the risk such as uh, during this current pandemic situation? I see. Um, so to echo what both of you just said, uh, uh, beyond the economy uh, contribution, I guess the Chinese family businesses, they are on the level of going out for foreign market, or they're doing that already. And uh, so their strategic behaviors, their operation in foreign countries are actually a reflection of China. So uh, on top of economic contribution to China, actually their behaviors can be a story to tell to the foreign audience, to the Western world, uh, what China is, right? So it, it's a way or a platform to tell the, the story of China uh, through their business. And uh, back to this question, uh, how, how they are uh, going to minimize the risks and uncertainties, I guess uh, first, the Chinese family business um, should keep focusing on what they are doing doing good already because uh, in the long-term orientation of the society, usually the financial resources and the strategies and the leverage they use is more conservative than uh, a lot of other countries. So I guess in the time of uh, uncertainty, they should still doing that to keep more cash flow, to be more conservative on uh, 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 investment. And when invest, they should do more long-term than short-term. And at the same time, they should polish their uh, uh, service and product and technology for the market growth. Uh, maybe at a short time in the future, it's more local market growth. And they use that to further invest in their technology and innovation and that may be the future growth in the in the foreign market when the economy is getting better. Right? So that's actually a reflection of the, what we are recently hearing, the dual circulation national strategy, right? So focus on your local market uh, while polishing your innovation ability for future foreign market growth. Um, and the last one I think is, uh, it's, ha it's, ha it's been happening for a few years is the opportunities of uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, in Western countries and Western market, um, when it, especially when it comes to a, a crisis, there's usually comes with opportunities. So it's always good to keep an eye for uh, opportunities for mergers and acquisitions in foreign uh, markets. So I think through these strategies, the Chinese family business are I have the confidence in them to keep doing well. Okay, um, thank you so much for the answer. And now I think that we're in the digital era and we cannot avoid what is the transformation of the digital and technology part. So I want to launch the question for both of the two professors. How should family business develop an advantageous position regarding technology and innovation in a competitive global business environment. Professor. Do you want to go first, Professor Mark? Yes. Sure. Professor Fan, please. Oh, oh. Okay. Uh, I, was, I was asking Professor Ma to, 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 yeah. to be the first speaker. But okay, um, uh, a very interesting question. And uh, I think it, it, it echoes quite nicely with my little presentation, uh, the last bit of, of my presentation that uh, looking back, the two ways, looking back and looking ahead. So I'll, I'll perhaps answer the question in these two categories. And uh, looking back, so the question asks us about how to um, maintain or to, to develop an advantageous position. And I think it, uh, uh, we all know that Chinese economy has been rapidly developing in the last three or four decades. And uh, look, well, uh, so, so a, a good starting point is to looking back to see what we did well or we did right in uh, in, in the development processes. And so, so, so that we can get some sense about how to continue to do so, to continue to develop. So that's the first part is the looking, uh, looking back part. 
The second part is the looking ahead part is that always, I think the, the short answer is always to keep an open mind and keep a learning mind because uh, the, the digital transformation era is always is, is constantly changing. And uh, being uh, in the uh, being uh, the downside of being a very successful entrepreneur sometimes is that you believe what you're doing too much that you you potentially might ignore that a, the environment is changing already. So uh, looking ahead towards, keep an open mind and keep a an learning mind. So that will be my answer. Good. I think that uh, we are pretty much on time. I don't know whether we have well, any Professor questions. Professor Mark can add, uh, definitely add. We have, ah, no, uh, good. Professor Mark, yeah. you didn't say anything. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, uh, for me, in, if we look at the, the, the um, research field in technology, technology and innovation management, we have a perspective of resource-based view, right? So when you want to invest in technology and innovation, you need resources. And um, on today's environment, I think, um, uh, first, financial resources I already mentioned uh, because of the long-term orientation. I guess that is uh, uh, scarce uh, resources, but for Chinese family businesses, they may, they may have a more advantageous position on it, this issue comparing to their uh, competitors in other countries. Um, what I want to highlight here is the, the talent, the human capital, the human resources they are going to have. Uh, an opportunity on because um, uh, we have been had the, the international student for uh, the past decades. Uh, China has been always the major source of a lot of um, countries' uh, international students. And now is the time uh, when these students are, you know, on the job market looking for a job and uh, maybe some of them have already worked in, in other countries for several years and they have the, uh, the working experiences and their uh, talent to contribute to uh, a Chinese economy now. So with the pandemic and the tough time, there might be a bigger talent uh, market uh, globally. And if I were the Chinese family business owners, I would pay extra attention to the talent and whether they can get more uh, uh, good employees and the good experts, good uh, work experiences to contribute to their own innovation technology development. Yeah, that's my uh, thoughts on this. Good. Thank you so much. And I think we have shared here both from the both professors and from the, the opening speeches, lots of knowledges. And thank you so much for, for sharing with us. I don't know whether we have more time to, to re receive any question. I think we have maybe five minutes. Uh, so if, uh, the, the system is reminding me we should end the, the session. Should we, uh, just to take one question or yeah, if somebody I think want to. Mm -hmm. If the participants have any questions, I'm sure um, it will be okay if we stay just a bit longer. So if somebody if in the audience has any question, you can raise your hand. Well, and, definitely uh, they mm -hmm. raise the most important question that is where to get this report. And if you if you hit the comment button, you'll see a link there already uh, that will that will lead you to uh, the download of the report so if you're interested